My name is Janet Montgomery. I'm an archaeological scientist. So I apply scientific techniques to the investigate uh, the human past. Principally, my interest is in finding out um, where people um, lived, what climate they were living in, what sort of things they ate, and how they moved around in the past. So we, there are, as you eat uh, and drink uh, while you're alive, you build your body basically out of um, food and drink that comes from your local environment, that gets into your skeleton, and that stays there during burial. So as archaeologists, we can take tiny samples from human skeletons and try to reconstruct the environment and the experiences and the mobility of people in the past. So the sort of archaeological science I do is to take evidence directly from the human remains and, and the remains of animals. So in the past, archaeologists would infer from a burial um, where the, who the person was, where they came from, what ethnicity they had, um, what types of activity they undertook, and they would do that based on uh, the grave goods in the grave, where somebody was buried, how they were buried, how the burial was constructed. Um, you know, this is a Viking type burial, this is an Anglo-Saxon type burial, this is um, a beaker burial. And that's what was all based on, on artifactual evidence. Uh, and the context of the burial. But with the methods that I use, we can actually reach back into the past and extract information about the person themselves directly from their human remains, from the, the skeletal remains, the bones and the teeth that, that are left behind. Okay, so, the, so the, the, the exciting thing about this is, is applying this isotopic technique that basically archaeologists have taken from environmental scientists, geologists, geochemists, to, to apply to, to, to humans. And it's because the different chemical elements in your skeleton, uh, in your food, in your drink, have what we call different isotope ratios. And these isotope ratios vary depending on a whole range of things. So, for example, the oxygen that is in the water that you drink, so water is, is made up of hydrogen oxygen, the oxygen has different isotope ratios depending what the climate was like when it fell as rain. So that varies across Britain, across Europe, across the world. The, the oxygen isotope ratio of drinking water varies. And we can tell, therefore, by measuring that in the teeth of a, of a human, whether they were living in a warm climate or a cold climate, somewhere where it rained a lot, somewhere where it didn't rain very much. A different isotope that we use is strontium. That varies depending on the geology in the region where a person sourced their food from. So where you grow your crops, where you graze your animals varies. So we can tell, um, for example, between a cow raised on chalk, say on the South Downs or the Yorkshire Walls, from a cow raised on the granites of the Scottish Highlands, for example. So we can tell. And if those animals then subsequently move somewhere else, we can tell that they're not from the place where we, we excavated them, where they were found. So my very favourite example is one that I actually did as part of my PhD uh, when I was a student and it was a burial that had just been found in London in Spitalfields. It was a young woman, she was about 20 years of age, very high status burial in a lead coffin, in a stone sarcophagus, fantastic grave goods and the, uh, the question was, was she born and raised uh, in England or had she come to England uh, during the Roman period from Rome or somewhere else in the Roman Empire. So we used the isotope uh, methods that we had to try and uh, answer this question. The thing was the, the strontium and the oxygen uh, didn't, they weren't diagnostic, they could have been found in a variety of places across Europe. So we used a different one, we used lead. Lead is very different because it's not telling you really about the natural environment people were living in, it's telling you about the, um, it's telling you about pollution, the types of pollution that people were exposed to. This didn't really happen in prehistory to a great extent, but in the Roman period, people used a lot of lead. They, they used it every day in their daily lives. Lead is a very useful metal. It, it can be used um, as in all sorts of ways in, the, in, in your daily life. So the Romans used quite a lot of it, and because of that, their environment was polluted. So we looked at the lead isotope ratio, and the thing was at the time, 
we couldn't actually tell where it was from. We knew it wasn't a British one, but we had no idea really where else in, the, in, in Europe or, or, or further afield you would get those values. And it wasn't until 10 years later when I got the opportunity to look at some burials from Imperial Rome itself that we found values that were an, eg an exact match for the lady in Spitalfields in London. And then we looked at some data on uh, silver denarii coming out of the Roman mints. And again, you, 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 you take the lead, you cupel the silver out of the lead to produce coins, and then you use the lead in, in you know, goes into general circulation. Those values, again, exactly the same as the, the Spitalfields lady. And then when we went back to the other isotope values, so the strontium and the oxygen, again, hers matched exactly the people from, from Imperial Rome. So that, that was the, one of the most exciting moments, actually, of my, uh, my academic career. I was so excited when I got that data. Um, because it, isotopes tell you where people didn't come from. They're not so good at telling you where people did come from. But, but when you get several strands of evidence that actually back each other up, it starts to look quite convincing, really, that you, you are getting very close to the, to the truth. You know, that lady grew up somewhere that was and exposed to the same sources of lead that people in Imperial Rome were. But these techniques are still very much in their early infancy, really. There's lots of things we, we don't know, um, things about human variation. Um, and one of the, the, the things that my students are currently working on now is to try and increase um, the temporal resolution. So what I mean by that is instead of saying this is an average value from 10 years of life, we wanted to focus right in on, on months, you know, months, a couple of months time so that we can look at seasonal diet, so we can see if people's diet changed from season to season, from, you know, the age of two to the age of 10. And we can do that with animals as well. And we can look at how animals um, were fed, when they were weaned, when they started to ruminate, how they were moved around the landscape, and, and then make you know, draw conclusions about how humans were do, uh, carrying out animal husbandry. So it's a very exciting time for, for isotope analysis, and we have fantastic facilities here at Durham. You know, I have students who are, are leading the way in these techniques, and you know, in, the, in the future we will be able to illuminate people's lives. So we will be able to look back 5,000 years and say, what was this child eating? Um, what climate were they living in and how did they move around, were they, how mobile were they?